Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in giving a very warm belong to welcome to former President Mary McAleese. Good morning, everyone. Um, good to be here, and well done to you. What a campaign you are running, and what a campaign you will win. Please, God, fingers crossed. Um, I want to just, uh, while I'm looking around here, um, I see um, one of the lead camp, two of the lead campaigners here. I see Simon Coveney and Jerry Buttermer, uh, who are doing phenomenal work. Um, thank you very much indeed, every one of you, for being here this morning. It's almost 40 years ago almost 40 years ago, um, since I first suggested, Ed might remember this, Ed Lynch, the idea of gay marriage on a radio programme in RTE. And um, sometime after I had become a founding member of the Campaign for Homosexual Law Reform, and I joined that campaign 40 years ago, just very shortly after Martin and I got married, um, after befriending two gay men whose story of the hatred directed at them in a Christian country, appalled, absolutely appalled me as a Christian and as a human rights activist, a civil rights activist. And it challenged me, and it still challenges me, to do something about it. Um, Cardinal Tagle, who is the Archbishop of Manila, he was speaking in London recently, and I think with commendable honesty, he lamented the fact his words, not mine, that Catholic Church teaching on homosexuality had led to people being branded and isolated from society. And the truth is that the vast majority of us grew up in an Ireland where homosexual acts were criminalised, where gay citizens could not live openly in loving relationships, and where they were often forced to live dreadfully unnecessarily lonely lives. When my mother uh, told an older gay male uh, friend that my son was gay some years ago, he, his response was immediate. The tears came into his eyes and he just started to cry. And he said to my mother, God help him, he'll have a lonely life. Because that's exactly what he had had and still has. And so when it came to writing our 1937 constitution, Ireland's gay citizens were completely overlooked. Nobody took them into account. Even the end of criminalisation did not end the problems of bullying, did not end the problems of the huge phenomenon of depression, self-harm and suicide by young gay people who bear the brunt and have traditionally borne the brunt of unjust and dangerous branding and isolation, to use the Cardinal's words. Dismantling the architecture of homophobia has been a very long journey. And I'm very grateful that my own gay son, my only son, grew up in a gay friendly household. But we were not able to protect him like so many parents of gay children, we were not able to protect him from the hostility of the outside world. And like every other parent of a gay child, we were worried sick about the man-made barriers that we knew he would encounter, including the constitutional barrier that would never let him marry the person he loved. And there's a particular irony in his case, since he is a twin and his heterosexual twin faces no such barrier. No parent brings a child into the world to consign them to second-class citizenship. And that is the one single question that remains to be answered at the end of this referendum debate. Why are gay citizens still denied full citizenship under the Irish Constitution? I have yet to hear a single convincing argument which justifies the continuation of this glaring inequality, especially now that we have this wonderful chance to remove it. On May 22nd, we, the adult citizens of Ireland, will be asked a really simple question. 
Do we agree to gay civil marriage? If we say yes, we will be conferring on our gay citizens the right to marry those they love in a registry office, in a civil ceremony. No more and no less. Martin and I, we've been happily married for almost 40 years. We're Catholics. We've campaigned for marriage equality for gay citizens as a family since before we had children. Before we had children, we were a family. We believe happy marriages are good for individuals and for society. We believe happy gay marriages will be very good for individuals and for society too. Will a yes vote affect my heterosexual marriage or any heterosexual marriage? Not in the least. But it will greatly affect my life and the lives of all parents of gay children and all gay children. It will give us peace of mind about our children's future and it will give us real pride in our country's commitment to true equality. It will also right an unacceptable wrong. Our gay children will be able to know the joy and the peace and the comfort of being part of a loving married couple, fully recognised at the highest level our country can offer. Gay children are born every single day in Ireland. They have no idea what lies ahead for them. And our parental hearts break as we watch them gradually and often secretly, as we have heard, discover they are gay and realise to their horror that their church, their community, the constitution of their country, and sometimes sadly, saddest of all, their own families, have branded and isolated them thanks to increasingly discredited old attitudes. The people of Ireland have already moved far beyond those attitudes. And as we come to what is the next logical step, which is marriage equality, it's entirely natural, perfectly acceptable, that an educated and a conscientious public should first explore every angle. We have done that. And now issues that have been hotly disputed are much clearer thanks to thoughtful and credible advice from independent experts. Concerns were raised about adoption. We now know those concerns have absolutely no basis in fact. Dr Geoffrey Shannon, head of the Adoption Authority and Ireland's leading expert on children and the law, along with Mr Justice Kevin Cross, the head of the Referendum Commission, and an expert on the legal consequences of the marriage referendum, have told us, both of them, unequivocally, that if the yes vote wins, the current law and practice in relation to adoption will not be changed in any single way. Mr Justice Cross is equally clear that this referendum has nothing at all to do with surrogacy. In fact, I think we have all ignored a very important reality that on both sides of the referendum argument, there is considerable agreement about the need to regulate surrogacy, a need that will exist and will continue to exist whether the no campaign wins or the yes campaign wins. No one in Ireland, whether heterosexual or homosexual, has a legal or constitutional right to procreation using surrogacy. No one. This referendum, if passed, will certainly not create such a right for gay people. It is a nonsense to think that it could, given that married heterosexuals who already enjoy the fullest <coughs> constitutional rights do not have such a right. Some have argued that civil partnership should be enough for gay citizens. As both Mr Justice Cross and the Law Society, which represents all solicitors in our country, as they recently pointed out, 
there are a huge number, a very considerable number, of legal differences between civil partnership and civil marriage. Civil partnership was an important advance, but the most important difference is that civil marriage has constitutional recognition and protection, while civil partnership does not. It is therefore vulnerable to future legislation which could add to the many disadvantages of civil partnership. Is gay marriage a human rights issue? We've been told that the European Convention on Human Rights of 1950 does not provide for gay marriage, and that is true. But what we haven't been told is that the Convention never ever set out to be a comprehensive statement of all possible human rights visible in 1950. It's a statement of minimal, basic human rights. It was, and it is what it always was, a lowest common denominator needed to get agreement from the widest possible range of countries and audiences. Countries with very different cultures, very, very different laws. I think back to the beginning of that convention when it was not possible to get agreement on capital punishment. So the right not to be capitally punished, punished was not enshrined in the convention then because they couldn't get agreement. It is now, all these years later. The convention was never intended to prevent individual countries from offering their citizens higher and better levels of protection and rights than those offered by the Convention. And in some instances, our country already does that. Quite the opposite. It was intended to encourage nations to advance and develop their human rights culture, to get ahead of the posse, to be leaders and champions of human rights. And that is exactly what this referendum is inviting us to do, for it offers the Irish people the chance to enhance our citizens' human rights by establishing the rights of gay citizens to secular, non-religious civil marriage. As Mr Justice Cross, head of the Referendum Commission, has pointed out, the referendum is not asking us to redefine civil marriage, nor is it asking us to redefine the family in Irish law. Any married couple in Ireland today, with or without children, constitutes a family under the Irish constitution. And it is that family, comprised often of just the spouses, two people, which is protected by our constitution. Like I said, when Martin and I married in 1975, we didn't have children until 1982. We were a family from 1975 to 1982. And now that our children are gone and married, we're still, the two of us, a family. Some churches take a very different view of these definitions of both marriage and family, and that is their right. They are perfectly entitled to hold to their own definitions and to have them fully respected by our laws, and in particular our constitutional laws, in relation to religious freedom. But they're not entitled to insist that their religious definitions should prevail in our secular civil law, which is entitled to make non-religious provision for all its citizens. This referendum is about extending to gay citizens the secular, non-religious right to marry in a registry office, a right that heterosexual citizens already enjoy under our constitution. There's a huge irony here, and it's an irony that no one has drawn attention to yet. And for all the many, many words, thousands and thousands of words, that have come from my own church, the Catholic Church, on marriage, I have not heard anyone yet explain why it is this. That here we have the church in a very, very substantial defense of heterosexual civil registry office marriage. But the Catholic Church itself does not recognize 
the right of Catholics to avail of civil registry office marriages. Not in one single document of many, many thousands of words explaining to me and my family the church position, have they explained that? I find that quite extraordinary. And but nonetheless, it is evidence, if any were necessary, of the considerable differences which already exist between church marriage on the one hand and secular civil registry marriage on the other. And incidentally, no court has ever challenged the church's position, the church's decision not to recognise the civil registry marriage of Catholics. That has never been challenged, nor has its teaching ever been legally challenged on this issue. So why should the teaching be challenged if the constitutional referendum is passed? It will not be challenged if the constitutional referendum is passed, because our, our constitution also guarantees full religious equality and full religious freedom. So this referendum has nothing in the wide world to do with church marriage. And a yes win, in my view, is completely incapable of having any legal or constitutional effect on church marriage or church teaching on marriage or church teaching on homosexuality, which incidentally is also absent from every single document produced by the church. Our constitution guarantees the church's full religious freedom. Some have pointed to the obvious physiological differences represented by heterosexual and homosexual relationships and the unique procreative capability of heterosexual marriages as justifying maintaining civil marriage as exclusive to heterosexuals. But while the intent to have children is essential for the validity of Catholic church marriage, procreation is not a stated purpose of secular civil marriage, nor is it a requirement for validity of secular civil registry office marriages. Another example of the huge differences between the two, differences that will continue to be completely honoured in our constitutional law. Others have insisted that marriage has served us well for centuries in its current form and should remain as it has been throughout history. That argument is barely credible, given the enormous social and legal changes to marriage in the last century alone, with the transition from property-dominated marriages in which women were very unequal second-class partners today to today's model of companionate marriages based on romantic love. Until the Catholic Church Code of Canon Law was changed in 1983, church law described marriage as a remedy for lust or in their words, concupiscence. <laughs> but check the dictionary. It means lust. <laughs> and it also went on to say that the widowed, it told people who were widowed, widows and widowers, this is what the Code of Canon Law said until 1983, a chaste widowhood was more honourable than remarrying. The church changed these and indeed many other similar restrictive teachings in relatively recent times. And indeed I'm very gratified that before the synod in October, the forthcoming synod in October, uh, Pope Francis has set up a working party to look at the church's teaching on homosexuality. The truth is that marriage is already one of the most rapidly evolving social institutions. Not so long ago, married women could not legally own their own property. They had to give up work on marriage. They could be legally, physically chastised, or God help us, even raped by their spouses with spousal impunity. 
It's only in recent years that anything like true equality between spouses and heterosexual marriage has been established. Gay marriage will strengthen that equality between the spouses, just as it will strengthen equality between citizens. As we approach the end of this referendum debate, there remains only one serious issue before us, and that is whether Ireland is or is not a genuine republic of equals, capable of accommodating a small and shamefully treated minority by giving gay men and women the right to secular civil law, in secular civil law, to marry those whom they choose to love. We who are parents, brothers and sisters, colleagues and friends of Ireland's gay citizens, we know how they have suffered because of second class citizenship. This referendum is about them and about them alone. The only children who are certain to be affected by this referendum are Ireland's gay children. It is their future which is at stake. They are unfortunately too few in number to win this referendum on their own. We the majority, we have to make it happen for them. And for all the unborn gay children who are relying on us to end the branding, end the isolation, end the inequality, quite literally, once and for all, in our constitution. A yes vote, vote, a yes vote costs the rest of us nothing. And no vote costs our gay children everything. Why? Because differential treatment of gay citizens by excluding them from secular civil marriage undermines civil, civic equality and more importantly, it permanently locks in inequality. So I'm hoping that our voters, young and old, Irish born and new Irish, will open their hearts on May 22nd, that they liberate our country from branding and isolation, that they liberate our gay citizens, born and unborn, from the injustice of generations of branding, isolation, inequality. I believe that together we have this wonderful opportunity to open the doors and let the future in. I see nothing to fear in that future. I see nothing but fear in the past. So, I hope we we'll use this remarkable present moment to advance the idea of the Republic described almost a hundred years ago in the proclamation by those who fought for the freedom that we will exercise when we exercise our vote on Friday. They proclaimed a Republic that guaranteed religious and civil liberty, equal rights and opportunities to all its citizens and resolved to cherish all of the children of the nation equally. We're not there yet, but on May 22nd, we can make those letters IRE in the word Ireland stand for Ireland Republic of Equals. It will take just this one historic act of communal solidarity, embracing the future, embracing love, embracing equality, when we confer on our gay citizens full civic equality for the very, very first time. Thank you for what you're doing, every one of you, to make it happen. <laughs>